Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to IPFW and the Reinhardt Auditorium for the second omnibus presentation in the 2016-17 lecture series. I'm Angie Finn Cannon, and I serve as the Vice Chancellor for Advancement here at IPFW. I greet you tonight on behalf of our Chancellor, Vicki L. Carwine. Vicki cannot be here tonight due to a minor medical procedure and strict instructions by her doctor to behave. She sends her greetings, and we look forward to having her back next week. I think this is the first omnibus she has ever missed. We almost had a perfect attendance pin for her. She blew it. Tonight's omnibus lecture series is sponsored by the English Bonter Mitchell Foundation, our founding sponsor since its inception in 1995. Through the generosity of this foundation, all of the more than 100 omnibus lectures have been offered free of charge to this campus and to our community. So thank you, English Bonner Mitchell. I also would like to thank our, our media sponsors tonight, Wayne TV Channel 15, 89.1 WBOI News and Diverse Music, and the Greater Fort Wayne Business Weekly, who continue to support us year after year by helping us promote these outstanding events. Thank you to our sponsors. I'm very proud that IPFW sponsors a program that can bring this caliber of national and international thinkers here to Northeast Indiana, where they can interact with our students and also engage with our community and to have an outstanding speaker like Charlie Savage here tonight, who has his roots right here in Fort Wayne, is an exciting combination. I understand that Charlie Savage's parents are in the audience. Are they out there anywhere? Please stand and be recognized. There they are. Welcome. Earlier today, Mr. Savage met with students from Communication, History, Honors, International Studies, and Political Science for a question and answer session. It was an experience they will carry into the future and exactly the kind of real life learning opportunities that we love to provide. The Omnibus Lecture Series allows IPFW to host outstanding individuals who share their unique brand of insight through experiences that provide intellectual impact for our students, our community, and of course this region. After this evening's lecture, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of our speaker. There will be one microphone on the first level and also one on the second level. Please use the microphone with your questions so that all can hear and please keep your questions short and limited to one topic so that we may accommodate as many people as possible during that limited time of questions. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Brandon Buchillen, visiting assistant professor of communication, to introduce tonight's speaker. Professor Buchillen came to us from the University of North Carolina, Asheville, where he was a finalist for the Distinguished Teacher of the Year Award. Here at IPFW, he teaches news reporting and writing feature writing, and multimedia design and production in the communication department. His research focuses on social capital, the personal value of the trust and relationships that we have with others, and the impacts on it occurring from Facebook and other social media outlets. Please welcome with me visiting assistant professor Brandon Buchillen. Good evening. Thank you very much. So a great man once told me that politics is the balance of money and power. And that's true in my estimation. We saw that balance being struck, that distribution getting meted out on Tuesday night in the presidential election. But that also happens at the state and local levels, like on our campus. Indeed, if you're paying attention, you can't miss it. But in the face of this constant struggle for money and power, what we increasingly lack are those willing to speak the truth to the process. So tonight, it is my absolute pleasure to be able to welcome one of those people. Charlie Savage is a Fort Wayne native and Pulitzer Prize winner. 
He graduated from Northside High in 1994 before earning his bachelor's from Harvard College and later his master's from Yale Law as part of a journalism fellowship for the Knight Foundation. He got to start reporting at the Miami Herald in 1999 before moving to the Boston Globe in 2003, where he won his Pulitzer Prize in 2007 as part of a series about the use of presidential signing statements. In 2008, Charlie moved to the New York Times, where he still reports as part of the paper's Washington, D.C. Bureau. He covers the Supreme Court, Homeland Security, along with U.S. detention and interrogation policies. He's written two books, Power Wars, Inside Obama's Post-9-11 Presidency, and also Takeover, The Return of the Imperial Presidency and the Subversion of American Democracy. His other awards include the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award, the Gerald R. Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency, and the Helen Bernstein Award for Excellence in Journalism. So when I tell you again that Charlie isn't afraid to speak truth to power, you'll believe me. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Charlie Savage. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? All right, well, thank you so much for coming out here tonight, and thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction. This is, I, I, I do speak from time to time, but this is a unique and special experience for me to come back to my hometown. I've maintained my ties here. My parents, as you know, are, are still here. My children come every summer and spend about a month here uh, with them. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's coming on, a, and I, I still have, I'm sure there's plenty of high school friends in the audience, I've, I've maintained those relationships, but that's a personal life uh, sort of thing. And it's a real pleasure and a real honor to share with Fort Wayne or, uh, some of what I do professionally and how sort of my career has gone in this direction and in in, in what I've developed. So I, I really appreciate it. It's a great honor to be here. And just before I get quite into it, I did want to single out one person I think is in the audience, although the, the Klieg lights are in my eyes. I do believe Norma Teeley is here. Is she, are you guys out there somewhere? Uh, she was my journalism advisor in Northside High School. Got my start in journalism under her tutelage. I think it's, it's safe to say that I, I don't know what I'd be doing in life without Miss Teeley in that journalism class, but it, it was her influence that really pushed me down the first couple steps down the road that has brought me here 20, 25 years later. So thank you, Miss Teeley. I'm glad you're here. Um, so this is a talk that developed out of my second book, which came out about a, a year ago, and I've continued to refine it. It is, and I'll get into it as, as you'll see, it is a, it's a book about President Obama, about national security and the rule of law and individual rights and how he handled the dilemmas and the powers and the programs that he inherited from Doug Bush and Dick Cheney uh, eight years ago now and some of the surprises that developed out of uh, that record. And of course now we're, he's about to pass the torch as well and you can be sure as in the answer to every question that I've received from talking to students and professors today, I will indeed talk about our next president at the end of this to try to bring it up to date. So but let's start not with where we are now, but where we were eight or nine years ago uh, with a young Senator Barack Obama. This administration also puts forward a false choice between the liberties we cherish and the security we provide. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our Constitution and our freedom. So criticizing, obviously, the Bush administration's response to 9-11, Senator Obama, this is a speech in August of 2007 at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. He's not been done much with national security yet. This is his major national security speech as he's preparing to run for president and show that he could be the commander in chief. And his core message is the Bush administration has put forward a false choice between liberty and security. He will do both at once. He will protect the country without undermining individual rights in the Constitution. That is who the country thought they were electing in 2008. People on the left were happy about it. People on the right 
or maybe not so happy about it, but everyone basically thought that that was what the next president was going to do. However, to I think everyone's surprise, after President Obama took office and started, uh, took command of the executive branch and national security powers and started dealing with terrorism and so forth, uh, uh, there, there emerged a split between expectations and reality. So these are some headlines from the New York Times in that first year or two. I wrote about half of these stories, but other people wrote others. Obama backs off reversal on secrets. Rendition to continue. Detainee policy in Afghanistan upheld. President's detention plan tests American legal. President's to keep military tribunals. Drone strikes in Pakistan. Hard line against leakers, killing an American citizen, defending surveillance, a kill list. This was the reality of President Obama's national security policy. And the sort of shift in some ways can be captured by a moment in June of 2013 when Edward Snowden leaks the first, well, he leaks it all at once, but the first secrets begin to be published from a vast archive of documents about the National Security Agency and the American surveillance apparatus that President Obama has been by then overseen for over four years. And it's clear, abundantly clear, and among other things, that all of our phone call, records of all of our phone calls are being collected secretly and held by the government. That was the first secret that a system has been built into Gmail and Yahoo Mail and Hotmail allowing the government to uh, copy email accounts of foreigners without a warrant, even if those foreigners are communicating with Americans, the PRISM program and so forth. And President Obama is confronted by these secrets, and this is what he has to say. But I think it's important to re recognize that uh, you can't have 100% security and also then have 100% privacy and zero inconvenience. Uh, you know, they, they, we're, we're going to have to make some choices uh, as a society. So from I reject as false the choice between liberty and security to it's important to recognize we have to make some choices in society. We can't have 100% of both. This is the evolution of Obama, the idealistic senator, and Obama, the president and commander in chief. And all of these different policies captured by those earlier headlines and this moment with Snowden and so forth led to and fueled a recurring criticism of Obama, an accusation that I think uh, in this area will be a defining one when history looks back at this period. But you began to hear it quite early. And the accusation was Obama is acting like Bush. Obama is acting like Bush. Whether that was said with a sense of betrayal from sort of American Civil Liberties Union types who thought they were voting for change and didn't get it, or it was said with a sense of vindication from uh, veterans of the Bush administration who saw these things that Obama had kept rather than jettisoning and said that retroactively shows that all that criticism that Bush and Cheney were receiving was nonsense. It was opportunistic partisanship, but look, a liberal Democrat gets into office, he does the same thing, and that must show that it was the right thing to do all along. We are vindicated. Obama has normalized and entrenched these policies. Either way, the critique from the left and the right of the White House is Obama's acting like Bush. The Obama people, of course, you won't be surprised to know, reject that criticism, and they say, no, the left is wrong, the right is wrong, and we aren't acting like Bush at all. And my, so my work, in addition to observing and chronicling and investigating all these different policies, surveillance, Guantanamo, drones, secrecy, leak investigations, was also an attempt to understand, not to criticize, not to defend, but to understand what happened. How did this happen? How did we get here? What is the meaning of this break between the expectations created by Obama's campaign rhetoric and what actually played out? So that's what, in part, what this book is about, and that's part, in part what this presentation is about. Let me start by taking you back to Obama's inauguration eight years ago. You may remember this was the midst of the financial crisis. 
Iraq was a mess. Democrats swept into power in 2006 in the midterms and then added to those gains in 2008. And Obama is elected as the first black president. Democrats have a filibuster proof 60 vote majority in the Senate. And it seems like the, the wind is at their back. And among the very first things Obama does is he issues, I mean, this is the first two or three days in office. This was a big part of what his transition team was developing in the period between the election, the period we're in now for the Trump administration, was a series of executive orders that promise in rapid fire uh, fashion, shut down CIA prisons, end torture, close the Guantanamo prison camp within a year. And it's sort of breathtaking, the amount of change that embodied in these quick orders in this, in this area. We may see something similar to that uh, in, in January of next year. But not necessarily in this area, but maybe in domestic policy, healthcare, and so forth. But for people like me, who had spent the last six, seven years deeply immersed in chronicling all these things, it raised the question of whether the war on terror was over, just like that. No more. All the stuff that we had been spending so much time thinking about, drones and rendition and torture, is it over? Am I going to have to find something else to do for a living? I remember joking with a colleague who also works in this area that, you know, I wonder if there's an opening in the sports department. You know? <laughs> well, the Times let me cover the Cubs. They probably wouldn't. Um, but uh, maybe happily for me, maybe not so happily for the world, terrorism remained a problem and the war on terror continued. Uh, in fact, from my vantage point, it was, it was clear within three or four weeks that there was going to be greater continuity with the policies that Obama had inherited from the Bush administration than everyone thought. The, the new Obama administration was going into court. They were continuing to assert the state secrets privilege to shut down lawsuits challenging Bush-era torture and Bush-era surveillance policies. They had set the members of Obama's cabinet, like Eric Holder and Leon Panetta, had said during their confirmation hearings that indefinite detention without trial was legitimate, was lawful, was a tool that was in fact available to the government, that they were gonna keep extraordinary rendition transfers of uh, prisoners from one intelligence service to another country's intelligence service without court oversight and extradition procedures and so forth. And so I called up the White House and I said, I'm gonna write a story that says Obama is going to have greater continuity with Bush's war on terror policies than anyone thought. And whoops, whoops, getting ahead of myself. And so one of the differences between the Bush administration and the Obama administration was the, Bush, the Obama administration was really interested in explaining itself. They wanted to engage with me and by extension with all of you and the readers in a way that the Bush administration Maybe it weren't like this at first, I don't know. I didn't cover to DC until 2003, but certainly by the time I was writing about these issues, they had no interest in engaging. There's a read our press release and go away. You know, we're gonna do what we're gonna do. Uh, so the, Bush, the Obama people called me in to the White House and I went and I met this guy. Actually, I knew, I'd known him briefly before, but I got to sit down in his office. His name is Greg Craig. He was Obama's first White House counsel, the top lawyer in the White House. And Obama's current chief of staff at the time was also in that meeting. But, but Greg did all the talking. And I explained, look, I'm seeing this pattern where you, people thought you weren't going to do this, and you're doing this. People thought you weren't going to do that. And you're saying, well, for now, at least we're going to keep doing that. And his message to me was, well, look, this is serious stuff. We're not going to be reckless. We're not going to shoot from the hip. This isn't about bumper sticker slogans. We went out to the Pentagon during the transition. We went out to Langley, the CIA headquarters. We had them explain all the stuff they were doing, and we're gonna move cautiously here. And that doesn't mean, though, that we've signed on to the Bush view of the world. We're charting our own course. And that is our message to the people criticizing us on the left, and that is our message to people criticizing us on the right. Another very top Obama official leader put it like this, you know, the, the ship of government is like a gigantic cruise ship. And if it goes off course, you can't just immediately teleport to where you want it to be. You have to gradually, slowly turn it and point it in the direction so that eventually it gets to where it should have been in the first place. Of course, they're saying, you know, if we had been in charge after 9-11, we wouldn't have had torture, we wouldn't have had Guantanamo, but we inherited Guantanamo. There's people there now. We can't just, like, open the doors and let them all out. And We have to be careful and deliberate about this, but give us time. 
So that was the message. So that I went on and I continued to cover these issues as they arose and Obama's announcing that he's gonna keep indefinite detention and he's announcing he's gonna keep military commissions. On the other hand, he's changing other things and it's sort of a muddle, it's harder to say where the things are going. And it's a little of each. Eventually, I end up uh, teaching a class. This is, becomes important, it's a personal note, but it becomes important to the broader topic uh, on, at Georgetown University on the Constitution and national security. And as part of that class, it forced designing the readings for the students and the lectures forces me to pull out of the weeds of the inf you know today's story and tomorrow's newspaper story and try to think about it from a big picture perspective. You know, all these things are in flux, not just because of the Bush administration, but just because of the world. Things that we thought were settled in the 20th century turn out not to be settled anymore because the rules were not written for the situation in which we're finding ourselves. The laws of war are written for clashes between two nation state armies on a literal battlefield wearing uniforms. Now, how do they work when you're applying it to a transnational network of terrorists who hide among civilians and move among countries and hide in badlands? Is there still constraint? Uh, what are those constraints? The laws of surveillance are written for phone systems, but everyone communicates by the internet now, and the internet works very differently. The words of the statute don't even line up with how, uh, how the, the technology and what's necessary to intercept an email on a switch as opposed to a telephone call. So what, is, is, what does that mean? What are the 10 things these students needed to know about surveillance and what's in play today to be educated? What are the 10 things they need to know about detention that's in play, so, uh, interrogation? So that the next time a terrorism suspect is arrested and they're talking on CNN about you know, should, when is he gonna get the Miranda warning, they understand not just what is a Miranda warning, which is of course that you have the right to remain silent and have a lawyer, but what it means that sometimes you might not get that, and how we got to the point where this might be a routinely exercised power when it would have been unheard of 10 or 20 years earlier to let someone be in custody for a long time and interrogate them without reading them their rights. What is it they need to know? So I'm cruising along, I'm, I've got this class, and then, then we get to the Snowden leaks, the summer of 2013. Obama's been reelected, and all this stuff comes out. And it becomes clearer than ever that especially in the world of surveillance, Obama has not changed anything at all about the uh, vast spying apparatus that he inherited from the Bush administration. And I decide, look, at this point, I want to do something bigger than I can do in just a newspaper article. I want to show how all these issues are connected. I want to bring that sort of insight of here's the 10 things you need to know about all these different topics and weave them together with behind the scenes stories of what was actually happening when these abstract problems were in play in some real world situation. Because I know all these people. I've been covering them for years. I know their phone numbers. They go to, out to dinner with me sometimes. And I can get them to talk to me on background about situations that illustrate these dilemmas where something happens in the real world People who view themselves as you know, obeying the rule of law are grappling with it. They are all on the same team and yet they don't agree with each other because every option has its downsides. There is no perfect answer, but eventually they have to pick something. They pick this, here's what that argument was, here's why it played out that way, and it can illustrate this stuff. So that leads to the book. Now, there's, there's a, so if you read the book, and it's a long book, I apologize for that. It turns out it's a very sprawling topic to write about everything. Uh, but uh, you can, you know, there's a, you go to the, the, the front of it, you can flip around to different parts and see what you're interested in. There's a lot of just sort of stories you'll see that illustrate discrete issues. But some big picture thoughts or takeaways uh, about the era we've been living to, through and why it played out the way it did arise from it. So I'm going to talk about three of them here, and then we'll move on to, to Trump at the end and then questions. The first takeaway is the absolute critical importance of one particular terrorist attack. There's been so many terrorist attacks, not big ones like 9-11, but you know, mid-sized small ones like San Bernardino and Orlando and the Boston Marathon and other ones that didn't even uh, uh, work and so we don't even remember them anymore. The bomb didn't go off in Times Square, but they found it, so that was, that was fine. The, that they all blur together, I think, into popular consciousness. But inside the government and the Obama administration, 
one singular attempted attack stands out, and that is the December 25, 2009 uh, attempt to blow up a plane flying into Detroit by this man. Can I make this work? Umar Farouk Abdumatalib, there he is in action, a Nigerian uh, who had gone up to Yemen, got hooked up with Al-Qaeda's branch there, which is usually called AQAP for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and they had sent him to blow up this plane on Christmas as it flew into Detroit with a bomb hidden kind of uh, undignifiedly in his underwear, the Christmas underwear bomber. So he ignites it, and it's supposed to blow up, but it doesn't. It just bursts into flame on his lap, and fortunately, uh, everyone does not die. He's badly burned, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> sort of burned in a gruesome way, if you can imagine burning your underwear. Uh, and that's a, so, so no, one is, no one is killed. It's okay. But it has catastrophic impact in a different way. Uh, first of all, for, for, the, for this new Obama team that's been in office less, less than a year. First of all, of course, there's just the gut-wrenching fact that it came so close to working. It's just the fact that the bomb didn't go off, that, it, that saved these 300 people from being killed on Christmas over American soil. Uh, so there's the, the, the clinching reality of that. But even more importantly, just from a consequential perspective, the political fallout from this particular failed attack is absolutely brutal. Uh, Republicans, I mentioned in 2008, just got totally crushed for the second election in a row. They were in complete disarray. Democrats had this historic victory. They had a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate. They looked, uh, you know, it was like pretty much a mirror image of right now. When Democrats are in total uh, d disarray, and Republicans will have total control of the government. Every, whenever this happens, people are like, oh, this party is dead forever, but it always comes back. So Democrats will come back, just as Republicans did. But the beginning of the Republican comeback was this event, because they had a hook to attack this new, this very popular new president. The hook was he's, he's, these policies he's changed from Bush, are uh, at least the rhetoric about not talking about is, you know, Islamic extremism and so forth. This is the origin of all of that. Uh, made us, makes us less safe. He doesn't realize we're actually at war. We're all going to get killed because of Obama and his weakness. And all of this stuff starts flowing out. And there's a great f wave of fear. The, and the plans to bring the 9 11 perpetr perpetrators from Guantanamo and try them in New York City in a real court collapse at this moment because even in liberal New York City, people are suddenly freaking out about terrorism. And in particular, in Massachusetts, the most liberal state in the country, there's going to be a special election in January of 2010 to fill the Senate seat left vacant when Ted Kennedy died. And to the shock of everyone, uh, a Republican, Scott Brown, sweeps to victory and takes the Ted Kennedy Senate seat in the most liberal state. Uh, there's a lot of bad punditry about this race at this moment. And out here, away from Massachusetts, uh, certainly in D.C., where I was, the, the common theme was, oh, this was about Obamacare, this was about the rise of the Tea Party. Scott Brown is like the least Tea Party Republican ever. And they already had Romney care in Massachusetts, and so they didn't really care about Obamacare. To the extent anyone in Massachusetts actually cared about Obamacare, not wanting to see it expand to the rest of the country, they already knew that in December, before the underwear attack and it was baked into the polls, and Scott Brown was still going to lose handily. What happened was the Christmas underwear bomb attack. And Scott Brown starts, after conducting a poll, this is an internal poll from his campaign that his campaign manager later gave me. They, they tested a bunch of different questions, and one of them was this one. You know, Obama let the FBI interrogate this guy they pulled off the plane in Detroit. Should he have done that, or should they have sent him to Gitmo and just sort of uh, not given him any rights? And even in Massachusetts, at this moment of fear, overwhelmingly, people were like, that's what I agree with. And so Scott Brown puts, starts cutting TV commercials, hammering on this issue. In the final debates in Massachusetts, he hammers on this issue that Obama and his Democratic opponent, Martha Coakley, are weak on terror, and he wins the race. And even though outside people are like, oh, this is about Obamacare, 
people who knew, the insiders knew this. This data is shared among Republican leaders and Democratic leaders in the House, and they realize that some, there's something very potent here. And so inside the Obama administration, there's a great clinching. It's not just about the fact that people almost got killed. It is the fear that one year after this historic victory, it could all be destroyed. If there is a successful major terrorist attack on American soil, they realize Obama will be a failed one-term president. Everything they're trying to do will be, will be rolled back, not just you know, ending torture and getting out of major land wars in the Middle East, but you know, expanding health insurance and all this unrelated stuff will all go to the wayside if they can't stop another attack from happening. And so all kinds of policy shifts at this point. The, the administration stiffens, it, it, it hardens, and a huge amount of stuff can be traceable to this. People who are in the meetings at those times talk about how Obama went from just passively listening when security state people, the CIA director and whatnot, were briefing him about what they were doing with terrorism, because he's juggling 50 different things, to saying, what more can you do? What do you not have that you need? Why aren't you doing this other thing, too? They gain influence, they gain power. And the voices of reform and saying, we don't need this anymore, and we should let this guy out of Guantanamo, and we should be open about this other thing, get very quiet. Uh, the Guantanamo closure plan collapses at this moment because the attack came from Yemen. Obama, for political reasons, places a moratorium on transferring anyone back to Yemen from Guantanamo, no matter how low level they were. And because about half the detainee population at that point was Yemenis, that meant Guantanamo was never going to close. Uh, I already talked about the civilian case, the civilian trial for the 9-11 guys being rescinded. The plan is to try them in New York. That was viewed by the ACLU types as the number one restore the rule of law thing to have a regular trial for those guys. Miranda, Mirandizing terrorists becomes partisan. Drone strikes ramp up. And this is the most important thing for Obama's record because the number one thing that I think history will say about Obama that was aggressive in this area that went beyond what Bush did is that he deliberately kills an American citizen, Anwar Alaki, without a trial. There's a drone strike in Yemen the following year. Anwar Alki is a radical Muslim cleric born in New Mexico, making him an American citizen. Here's the underwear bomber, Abdul Muttalib. Here's Alaki. Here's the head of the terrorist network. They're all very happy. They're making his martyrdom video for that operation. He can't be arrested. He's out in rural Yemen. There's no government control there. The Yemeni government has not given us uh, permission to put people on the ground, but we have drones overhead. The Yemeni government has said secretly we can kill people from the air, and they decide that under this situation, if they find him, they can kill him, and they do, without a trial. So that's takeaway number one. Understanding how Obama acted harder than people thought he was going to on counterterrorism issues stems greatly from the fallout from this one attack, the Christmas underwear bombing. The second takeaway is that when people say Obama acted like Bush, you have to ask them, what do you mean by acting like Bush? Because it is easier to see now than it was during the Bush years that when people were criticizing Bush and Cheney for overreach in the post 9-11 era, they were often making two very different critiques that kind of sounded like it was the same, two ways of saying the same thing. The critique was, you would go to you know, a panel discussion or whatever, and, or read an op-ed in the paper, and it was, Bush is violating civil liberties and the rule of law. But these are two very different things. The civil liberties problem, if there was one, with what Bush was doing, or a civil liberties critique, is predicated on the idea of the state versus the individual. The government as a whole should not have the power versus individual rights to torture someone, to listen to anybody's phone calls without a warrant from a judge, to prosecute someone in a military trial where they don't get full due process protections. It's about individual rights. The rule of law critique, however, is about process. It's, it's agnostic about whether warrantless wiretapping or military commissions are maybe a good idea or a bad idea. Maybe they're a good idea because of the challenge of international terrorism. But it's worried about what is the legal authority for these policies, and in particular, if Congress has enacted a law that says you can't do this, that says you must get a warrant if you're going to wiretap on domestic soil, if you're going to try someone, it has to be a military court that looks like this, not like that, 
the president does not get to disobey that law just because he wants to, just because he thinks the law doesn't make sense anymore. He doesn't get to say, as Bush did over and over and over again, that he is the commander in chief and therefore the Constitution lets him do whatever he wants without constraint from the other branches of government when it comes to protecting national security. The president is not above the law. If, and so one of the two ways in which these two things are very different is that the civil liberties problem with a policy cannot be resolved except by stopping that policy. The president, you know, if the problem is warrantless wiretapping, the solution is get a warrant. But the rule of law problem with a policy can be fixed in a way that allows that policy to keep going by going to Congress and getting Congress to change the law so that instead of forbidding what the government wants to do, it now authorizes it. And in fact, that's what happened a lot in Bush's second term. Again and again, Congress enacted legislation like the Military Commissions Act, like the FISA Amendments Act, that kind of retroactively, or at least blessed and authorized programs that Bush had put in place unilaterally based on this very uh, aggressive and controversial claim of executive power. And we know now, even though we didn't know at the time, that also behind the scenes, the secret intelligence court in Washington was issuing rulings and orders that were sort of normalizing and regularizing some of the bulk data collection programs, like the phone records program that Edward Snowden reveals many years later. So that by the time Obama took office in January of 2009, the rule of law problem with a lot of these programs had been drained away. Even though, from an ACLU sort of individual rights perspective, the civil liberties problem remained, because you don't care whether Congress has blessed something if you think it violates individual rights, it's still a problem. So the rule of law critique could be what it means to act like Bush, or the, the civil liberties critique could be what it acts like Bush. And part two of this is that Obama is a lawyer. Joe Biden is a lawyer. George Bush is not a lawyer. Dick Cheney's not a lawyer. The Bush administration had very little trust in lawyers and the lawyerly mindset. A lot of the, po the senior policymakers that filled Bush's cabinet mostly were not lawyers, had not been to law school. By contrast, Obama was most comfortable talking to people who had been through law school and had that way of thinking about problems and talking about the world. So he, not only did he give lawyers a much bigger role in shaping policy in deliberations, but he also put lawyers in policy-making roles. There's a million examples of this, but one example that's easy to sort of throw out there is Secretary of State. Obama's Secretaries of State, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, are both lawyers. Bush's, Condi Rice, and Colin Powell were not. That, but that replicates itself all through the upper branches of the administration. And so, of course, people who think like lawyers, are trained like lawyers, talk like lawyers, are more prone to see the problem with Bush, if there is one, as a rule of law problem, and to be satisfied if the rule of law authority has been fixed, even where other people might see the problem very differently. So here's one example of how this played out. This is how, one of the stories I tell in the book is how Obama learned that the National Security Agency was collecting records of all of our phone calls, and how he decided to keep that program rather than get rid of it when he became president. So on January, sorry, February, Fourth, I think, 2009, he's been president about two weeks. He is, comes to the Situation Room, this is the Situation Room, and for a briefing by, about the surveillance programs he has inherited. And he sits, this is not a picture of that briefing, this is a picture of a couple months later, someone leaked me this photo, but it gives you the idea. He sits at the head of the table, he's, and at the, around the table are the sort of incumbent leaders of the national security state, the FBI director, the NSA director, the CIA director, and their lawyers, and they're gonna tell him about all these different programs they have, and, and, and some of which he knew about, the sort of after 9-11 Bush administration created the Stellar Wind program secretly at the time that involved warrantless wiretapping and some other things. Some of that had, had leaked out, some of it he had even voted on in these reform bills I was talking about, but others had not become public, and one of them was this bulk phone records program. So he comes in, he's got Eric Holder, his newly confirmed attorney general at one side, he's got Greg Craig, that White House lawyer I told you about, there he is again, 
on the other side, they sit down at the head of the table, and these managers explain these different programs. And when they get to the bulk phone records program, they say, well, this was another one that Bush put in by himself, just saying he could, because he was the commander in chief. But over, like a lot of other things over time, uh, the, the rough edges were sanded off. We got a, a secret court orders authorizing it and going to the phone companies and giving us authority to take these records. And uh, we have this sort of theory that's based on the Patriot Act that says we can do that. Uh, now, so the, and we've briefed this over time to Congress so all three branches know about it. Not a rogue program. It's got rules. Now, we just figured out, it turned out that they were violating those rules systematically, but that seems to have been a technical problem. It wasn't intentional. We're going to fix it. And so you've got this thing, sir. And you know, this is implicitly saying, do you want to keep this or not? Although they don't quite cue it up that way. They're kind of like, this is an important program. Would have stopped 9-11, which is probably not true, but that's what they say to him at the time. And so his answer to them is, well, I'm comfortable with what you're telling me, I think, but I want my lawyers to take a look, meaning Greg Craig and Eric Holder. So Eric Holder and Greg Craig go off and they study the program more and they decide not to do anything more. In other words, they leave undisturbed Obama's initial decision to keep to this program, to mend it, not end it. And then four years go by and it's, exp it's exposed and there's this huge bipartisan uproar and there's basically no political support among Republicans or Democrats except for the ones who knew about it on the intelligence committees in Congress and eventually Congress passes a bill to end it. So in reporting out this, this book, I talked to about 150 current and former government officials. Not just once, but usually over and over again, depending on what I was working on that day. Mostly they would not, they talked to me on the condition I would not cite them as a, the source of any particular information, the background rules. But occasionally I was able to negotiate something on the record. And fortunately, Greg Craig here, again, let me say in the book what he had said when I asked him, why did you keep this? Look at this huge mess. You could have just nipped it in the bud and, resolved, and avoided this whole thing. Uh, why did you guys not tell Obama, you know, is this, this seems un-American, but there's, you know, there's no support for it among us. If it came out, we would be embarrassed. And he said, well, look, we thought it was very important that the, the intelligence court had blessed it and Congress knew about it, that it was not some crazy rogue program, but was part of the whole government was on board. Moreover, both I was a, Greg Craig is a former public defender. Eric Holder is a former federal prosecutor. They had done criminal cases, and they knew that often phone records are introduced in them, and there's never a constitutional issue. Because in 1979, the Supreme Court ruled that we have no Fourth Amendment right of privacy over the fact that we called somebody else. The contents of that call, we have a right of privacy over, but not the call itself, because we told the phone company we were calling them. And once you expose something to some third party, that means you don't have a privacy interest in it anymore, even phone records. Now that was a case in 1979 that involved one person's phone line for five days, not everyone in the country's phone lines and recording those calls for five years, but, but the, you know, the legal reasoning that when you expose something, you don't have a privacy interest, that doesn't turn on volume. A million times a zero, a million times zero is still zero. So we didn't think there was a constitutional issue. And because of this Patriot Act theory, we didn't think there was a statutory issue. And so there was legal authority, and so we were satisfied. And you see that this is the rule of law critique way of thinking about the problem. They were lawyers. If there, was a legal, if there wasn't legal authority, there was going to be a problem. If there was, no problem. They weren't asking the question about privacy, about Americans' rights, not in the constitutional sense, but just in the sense of how do we live in this country and well, how much information do we want the government to have about us. It didn't occur to them, the civil liberties question. That's a reason that this plays out this way. They're satisfied with the rule of law. That's takeaway number two, what it means to act like Bush terms on whether it's the rule of law critique or the civil liberties critique. But then this raises a kind of awkward question. Does it make any difference? See the joke here, I don't know if you can read it. One angel says to the other, I don't dance on the head of a pin unless I'm really drunk. <laughs> is, it, is, it dance, is it just angels on the head of a pin to say that, well, Bush and Obama are so different because Obama cared about the rule of law, didn't have this sort of crazy legal theory, and Bush didn't. You know, if Obama didn't actually end up not doing things that he didn't want, that he wanted to do because of the law, because they just, uh, was it just, in other words, creative lawyering? 
where the government wants to do X, and the Bush legal team's approach was to write a two-page memo. And the memo would say, you're the commander in chief. Yes, you can do X. You can do anything you want. Let's get lunch. And the Obama legal team approach was to write a 100-page memo. And it would go through all the permutations and have all the right footnotes and agonize. And it would say, well, maybe you can do X in that circumstance, or maybe you couldn't do it in this circumstance. But yes, in this circumstance in front of you, you can do X. Because at the end of the day, the government is still doing X. And there are indeed examples of what some people think are cynical lawyering, creative lawyering by the Obama administration. Places where it got into some hairy situation and they were throwing out legal theories that maybe weren't entirely off the wall, but most people think were probably not the best reading of the law. And this is very awkward in these areas because there's rarely a Supreme Court ruling that definitively says, here's the right answer. And so they have what some people called legally available theories. Not the best theory, but it would allow us to do what we want to do, and it's not laughably off the wall that the law might mean this. They did, they did that on several occasions that I talk about in the book. These headlines flick at it. The, uh, among them, for example, saying, uh, you know, we can go to war against ISIS without new authorization from Congress because ISIS is part of the Al-Qaeda war that Congress authorized after 9-11. This is controversial because ISIS is at war with Al-Qaeda. They hate each other. How can ISIS be part of the enemy if they're at war with each other? The answer is, well, they used to be together, and they split. But just because they both split, they, this sort of one entity split in half after Osama bin Laden was killed because they couldn't agree on who should be in charge, and one got to keep the brand name and the other didn't, does that really mean that we lost our ability to fight them both? Because certainly they're both still at war with us. These sorts of things people sort of raise their eyebrows at or, or worse and say, this is, this, you guys are not obeying the rule of law. That's, so there's some examples of that. But it, there's answers to some of this as well. So when I'm interviewing all these people, I often throw this at them. Well, does this make any difference? Are you guys just patting yourself on the back for something that doesn't really matter? It's just aesthetic. And without endorsing it, I'll at least tell you what they said. So the first answer was, yes, it does make a difference. Because even if we're having this sort of strained reading of a statute as allowing us to do something, we're not invoking this sweeping, the commander in chief can do whatever he wants without constraint theory of the Bush administration. And that's important. These are examples of memos from the Bush years saying the com commander in chief alone gets to decide whether we torture someone or not, regardless of if Congress has as a bandit. The reason it's important not to invoke this theory is that it leaves space for Congress to do its job and check the president if it wants to, especially if Congress knows that the president has said, for example, ISIS is part of al-Qaeda now for the purpose of the war. Because Congress can just, if it gets its act together, pass new legislation to close that loophole if it doesn't agree or it can allow it to exist and acquiesce. Whereas if you invoke this theory, there's no role for Congress at all. Really, the president is king at that moment, and that's it. His word is final. So that's important that they're, 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 they're going the 100-page memo route instead of the two-page memo route. The second answer is there are examples, not many, but some, where they didn't do something they wanted to do because they couldn't figure out a, a way, a legal way to do it, whereas if they had been more aggressive and just said the president is commander-in-chief, they could have done it. Uh, the most uh, obvious and easy to understand example of that is that Guantanamo prison remains open today. Why? Because Congress passed a law that said you can't bring the detainees under any circumstances into the United States. Obama's plan for closing Guantanamo hinges on bringing the last few dozen detainees who are deemed too dangerous to release to a different prison in the United States, maybe at Fort Leavenworth, and holding them in a new prison and then closing the old one. Because Congress said he couldn't do that, he hasn't done it, and that means that the law is acting as a constraint, uh, notwithstanding appearances sometimes. And the third one, and this is the last one I'll do before I turn to Trump, but I'll tell a story as well, is the, the most subtle one, but it's also maybe the most important one, and that is the following. If, this is their argument now, I'm channeling them, if you are an administration that cares about the rule of law, that wants the world to think of you as obeying the rule of law, want yourself to think of yourself as obeying the rule of law in a recognizable way, not this sort of 
anything goes Bush era way. You're going to have lawyers who are part of the deliberations before you've decided what it is you want to do. What is the legal authority? What is the of these various options? What is the argument we'll make if we go this route versus that route? What problems would it arise would arise if we did this versus that? And that is going to shape and discipline the deliberations and steer you away from more legally controversial things so that you never get to that X that seems to be illegal that you want to do in the first place. And so that's another way in which law influenced this administration in particular in a way that doesn't yield, and they wanted to do X and they didn't do X, like close Guantanamo, uh, because they, they pushed them away. So the example the, how, that illustrates how that might play out is the deliberations over Osama bin Laden. It's December, uh, sorry, it's uh, the August of 2010. The CIA has tracked a courier, an Al-Qaeda courier, to this strange compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. High walls, no, uh, no garbage is ever picked up there. They just burn their stuff inside. And very hard to see people coming in and out. And they think it might be, and no telephone service, even though it's in this sort of big mansion in the middle of this rich military garrison town. And they think that might be where Osama bin Laden is hiding. And they start, they spend a, a few more months sort of trying to figure out in various ways who might be in here. They got lots of surveillance looking down at it. By early 2011, they've decided they know as much as they're ever going to know about who's inside. They think it's, he's, it's him, but they're not sure. And it, and the, but they're shifting to what are we going to do about it? What is our course of action? Now the lawyers get involved as well as intelligence and, and military people, and they look at various options. Now, the easiest option, the, the least risky operationally, would be to bomb the compound to smithereens. Just drop some bombs on it and be done with it. That's what they would do clearly, in, you know, they do that every day in Yemen and tribal Pakistan. But the problem is that this is not a rural location. This is in the middle of a neighborhood, and they don't know what's underneath it. There might be tunnels under there. There might be a bomb shelter. Who knows? And so they want to make sure that whoever's in there is dead. To bomb it with that degree of certitude, they would have to drop such heavy ordnance on it that they would level the whole block around it. And all kinds of civilians would die. Not just you know, women and children who are in this compound because they're you know, Bin Laden's wife or whatever, but people who don't even know he's there, completely innocent people. And it is the case, however, in, in war, that collateral damage, civilian bystander deaths, can be lawful if it's uh, you know, necess deemed necessary and proportionate to a legitimate military aim. Killing the leader of the enemy is clearly a huge legitimate military aim. And so the lawyers were probably prepared to sign off on that option if Obama wanted to go that way. But the discussion of collateral damage and, the, and how many civilian deaths would be too many focused the early deliberations on the fact that there was going to be a lot of civilian deaths. There was going to be a massacre. And on top of that, because it would just be rubble, they might not ever know for sure whether the bin Laden was in there, and there would just be a public relations debacle. The United States had bombed this part of Pakistan it wasn't supposed to bomb and killed all these people, and you know, maybe he wasn't even there, or even if he was there, the claim would be he wasn't. And it was just deemed at that point a bad idea. And so Obama moves from that option to the higher risk option of the commando raid, the SEAL Team 6 raid, which goes in, doesn't kill everyone all around the neighborhood, and is able to bring out the body. So they don't get to a place where the, the lawyers had to sign off on killing several hundred civilians to get one man, because the legal deliberations disciplined and shaped and pushed them to a different option in the first place. So that's part three, why they would say that it mattered, even if it didn't appear to matter from the outside. So now what? How many people here thought on Tuesday morning that Donald Trump, well, I'm not asking whether you supported him or Hillary Clinton or any, someone else, but how many people actually thought he was going to be the next president? A few of you? I sure didn't. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I do national security, legal reporting. I'm just reading the same uh, political articles that you guys are, looking at the same polls. We were, at the New York Times, we were preparing for a, Trump, uh, a Clinton presidency. We had all these articles. Who's going to write about who's going to be in the cabinet? Who's going to write about what's Bill's role going to be? Who's going to write about blah, blah? All that stuff wadded up in the filtration on Wednesday and it was, like, was starting from scratch. Like, who's going to be in Trump's cabinet? Does he even know? Right? It's, I'm, it's, a, it's an amazing period. 
uh, that we're entering. Because this is going to be completely fascinating. Uh, and one of the ways it's going to be fascinating is that a Clinton presidency would have been, in many ways, just a third Obama term, right? She agreed with him on most things. We were really struggling to say, well, what can we say that's interesting where she might be different than Obama? Maybe she'll be marginally more aggressive about Syria or something. I mean, you're looking for these discrete things because 99.9% .9 of the policies were going to be the same. Trump obviously is running on, ran on a completely different platform. Anything Obama did, he was going to do the opposite of. On the other hand, you know, he's such a cipher. He's such a cipher, I think it's fair to say. Because he was, you know, going to ban all Muslims on a Monday, and on Tuesday, maybe he wasn't. Maybe that was just a negotiating position. You know, it, it, often he seemed to be throwing out policy proposals off the top of his head because some interviewer asked him. In my world, for example, some interviewer said, hey, what do you think about military commissions? Should Americans be tried there? And he's like, yeah, why not? I don't, you know, and so, right? And so, like, I'm earnestly writing an article a couple months ago saying, Trump says, but is he really saying that? Has he thought about it before? Is he ever going to think about it again? Is this actually his agenda? Is, you know, to what extent is he, is the, this is, this is I'm quite serious. I mean, he's obviously a genius, right? He defeated the Bushes, and then he defeated the Clintons. He ended the two biggest political dynasties of our generation. And he, he, he figured out how to, to redraw the map in a way that people did not think possible. No one took him seriously. And now he's going to be the most powerful man in the world. Uh, but in part of that strategy was to say all kinds of outrageous things and get all kinds of free media and, and sort of gin up people. Uh, is he actually going to govern that way? You know, did he actually run his companies in the way that he might have pretended to in a reality TV show? Or was that entertainment and this is business? So we don't know. We don't know. Early clues will be who he chooses to surround himself with. But in my world, the national security world, this is going to be particularly difficult because of all the Republican sort of establishment people who were upset about Trump, the never Trumpers, it, the national security people, the professionals who had come out of the Bush administration and the military intelligence, Justice Department, Homeland Security world, were the most never Trump. They were the ones that stuck to it the longest. They were out there signing letters saying this guy is totally going to be a disaster and is unfit to be president and, you know, anyone, anyone but Trump. And so now they're facing the question, uh, well, should I go, you know, eat humble pie and go work for Trump? And I think it would be easy for them to say, well, duty calls. I have an obligation to help the country now. He's the president. We've got to, you know, protect ourselves and, and run the country, even if I myself didn't support him. But will Trump take them? You know, is Trump the forgive and forget kind of guy? Uh, or is he the kind of like, you, you know, you, you denounce me in public so you can die kind of guy? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, because, and so that will be important to watch. One thing I would point out, though, about Trump and the claims that he is famous for making in this world, the, you know, we're going to bring back waterboarding and worse because torture works, and even if it doesn't, they deserve it anyway. That, that Trump, right? The, we're going to fill Guantanamo all the way back up again, Trump. The, we're going to place every mosque under surveillance and ban Muslims, Trump. Um, the, the, we're going to send American citizens to be prosecuted in Guantanamo before military courts, Trump, that guy, is if he wants to do those things, if he actually cares as opposed in plans to implement that, as opposed to just sort of being in practice a normal Republican who signs the bills that the Republican Congress sends him on cutting taxes and you know getting rid of Obamacare and uh, rolling back regulations and so forth. But if he's affirmatively trying to sort of reestablish the sort of post 9-11 first term Bush security state on steroids, some of Obama's approach these last eight years will help him. Because Obama's uh, sort of prudent approach was not to close the door entirely to a lot of what he inherited, with the exception maybe of torture. Obama, when he encountered the, you know, the military intelligence people who were like, well, you know what, if you get rid of indefinite detention without trial, you'll you can prosecute this bunch of guys at Gitmo 
and here's a bunch of guys you can probably just send back to their home countries, and they seem kind of low level, but there's a few dozen guys there that are unfriable, and they seem very risky to us. And if one of them attacks somebody later on, you know, the blood will be on your hands for letting them out. Or, you know, we can try most of these people, but this guy over here, he could only get a trial on a military commission because of the, there's problems with the evidence. It wouldn't be admissible in the civilian court. So if you get rid of military commissions entirely, this guy, I don't know what you're gonna do with him. Obama's approach over and over and over again was to keep these things, but to try to sort of normalize them, downsize them, uh, and, and not to, to use them sparingly, uh, but still to keep them available, which meant endorsing them as legitimate and lawful, just something that you don't want to use all the time, and in particular to impose self-restraints on them. He was, Obama was really into constraint as something that was both necessary as into itself, but also legitimized government power. He didn't want that constraint generally to come from outside the executive branch, though. So, you know, he fights to avoid judicial review of drone strikes, but, and successfully, but he adopts what's called the presidential policy guidance in May 2013, which are very strict rules for targeted killing operations. The, the target has to be a threat to American people personally, not just American interests. And it has to go through all these chains of review. The security state people don't like this. It's like tying their hands. And the number of drone strikes has gone down, but not to zero since then. Or, you know, after the leak investigations got out of control, he, in, in, in July of 2013, they put forward in the Justice Department new rules that it makes it harder to go after journalists' phone records and such when you're investigating a leak. Or, you know, they're, they're only going to use indefinite detention at Guantanamo and military commissions for inherited prisoners that don't work, but all new captured people will go to regular court. So we'll just use this sparingly. But the, the, the fact that he's kept these things available and went into court in some places and said, yes, this is lawful, when he could have said, we're going to get rid of it entirely, we don't think it's lawful, means that it's there now for a President Trump to take and jettison those executive orders and, that imposed restraints and open the throttle entirely. And if liberals don't like it, they'll say Obama did it, right? He's normalized it. And because he thought, of course, he could be trusted with this power. He was prudent. He would only use it a little bit when it was really necessary. And he thought his successor would be Hillary Clinton or someone like Mitt Romney. And so now his successor is instead Donald Trump. And we will see what Trump does with all this. And if Trump really goes to town on it, I think that will change or color or be the thing to think about when history looks back at how Obama handled the counterterrorism policies and controversy that he inherited from George W. Bush before him. Because it may, in fact, have set the stage for all those reforms to come to naught and to just legitimize this stuff as forever how America is going to handle things. But who knows? We'll see. So anyway, thank you very much for coming out tonight. And I'm happy to take some questions, but that's, that's the, the, the canned part of my presentation, although the, the Trump stuff is brand new. You'll be surprised to learn. Thank you. I have a question, sorry. Ah, yes, hi, sorry the lights are very bright. <laughs> sorry. Um, in the interim, until, um, until he takes over for President Obama, would Obama have the power and authority to make substantial differences within this period of time relating to Gitmo and every place else? Um, so the question is, Obama is still president January 20th, what more significant can he do in these areas um, before he hands the torch to President-elect Trump, uh, especially in the area of Guantanamo? So currently, Obama inherited 242 men at Guantanamo, brought no one new there, transferred over the last eight years, most of them, a few died as well. There are currently 60. And one of the things that Obama did, in addition to sorting through who they were initially, was he created a new kind of parole-like board made up of six representatives of six different security agencies, you know, justice, state, CIA, defense, so forth, 
And they periodically look at these guys and, and also look at where they would go if they were released and decide, you know, in, in this case, often we've been, we've been holding on to these guys for 14 years now. Is it still necessary? Is it still necessary to American security that this particular individual will be held without trial, even if the war continues and our ability to hold enemy wartime prisoners continues as a legal matter? Could we let this individual go, especially if he's going to go to a country that can keep an eye on him, where he might be rehabilitated, where he might have you know, a, a strong security state looking at him? Well, quite a lot of them have gone to Saudi Arabia and Oman and the Emirates and Dubai lately, where they are only kind of sort of free, to be honest. Um, so there are 20 more men who have been approved for transfer that would take that population from 60 down to 40. And they think that they are going to get those other 20 guys out before January 20th. So that would leave about 40, uh, maybe 39, maybe 41, but in that range left at Guantanamo uh, if they succeed in doing those other transfers, which I think will also go to these sort of Middle Eastern dictatorship places where being released doesn't really mean, you know, really nilly walking around. Uh, but I think that there is no chance, well, I mean, I mean th that he'll close the prison. Um, one reason for that is that, uh, I mean, of course, he could, he could literally do it. You could order the military to put the other 30, 40 guys on a plane and bring them to the supermax prison in Florence, Colorado, or the, the maximum security military prison at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, but Congress has banned that. And so it would take a Bush-like claim that the commander-in-chief cannot be bound by law, by statute, when it comes to handling wartime prisoners for him to do that. That would be a, a really extraordinary uh, assertion of executive power as Obama is walking out the door. And in particular, now that he knows, which I don't think he wanted to do even when he thought Clinton was going to be his successor. He just didn't, he didn't want that to be his epitaph. But in particular, now that Trump will be his successor, he would be a fool to do that. Why? Because, tr first of all, Trump would just order them put back on the plane and fly them back. So there would be no, it would accomplish nothing. And it would have set one more precedent for a president that a number of people are already worried may not respect the limits of his authority to cite, you know, a, a President Trump with a robust understanding of a president, a commander in chief's ability to act in defiance of law uh, might do a lot of things. And for Obama to do the, such a dramatic violation of the law, Obama has, has evoked that a few times. Not, as, not nearly, I mean, that was Bush and Cheney's signature claim, the commander in chief can do anything. Obama tried to stay away from that, but he never really disavowed it. It was one of those things where he sort of keeps it available. And uh, you might remember there was a controversy about a year or two ago where we had a prisoner exchange. We sent some high-level Taliban guys from Guantanamo to Qatar in exchange for Sergeant Bowie Bergdahl, who was uh, being held as a prisoner of war by the Taliban in, under some pretty horrific conditions for years, our only living POW, and we swapped them. And in doing that, Obama disobeyed a law that said he had to give Congress 30 days notice before moving someone out of Guantanamo. He just put him on the plane and he said, well, I've got, I had to move fast because even it was a controversial even in the Taliban, some you know, disgruntled Taliban member might have just killed Bergdahl when he realized they were gonna let him go. But what's the authority to do that? It's not a question of whether it's a good idea. What's your authority to violate this law? It had to be commander in chief power. So he's done that a little bit, but that's nowhere near as controversial and dramatic as bringing the prisoners into the United States would be. So on Guantanamo, I think it's definitely going to stay open, and there will be at least 40 people there when Trump takes office. Anyone else? Yes. For one thing, uh, I'm really honored that you're here and Poster Prize winner. I'm originally from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I'm very, very concerned, I hope this isn't off base, that Indiana Tech is closing down in June because the communications age is very important. And the reason why my mother talked about her in 1919, she spoke Yiddish and German and Romanian, that World War II is coming. And knowledge, the children are not learning about war. We are not a race for the human race. And I'm wondering what we could do um, 
here in Fort Wayne to make sure that Indiana Tech does not close down. So I'm not, I haven't heard the Indiana Tech where my father was a professor was shutting down. I wonder if something got, might be a little garbled about that, but I certainly agree with you that uh, education is extremely important and in these turbulent times in particular, we want to have people understanding what's happening. Uh, so thank you, go ahead. How do you feel about the public's growing disdain for the media and then, in, in their eyes, the media's inability to report the truth and what can be done to encourage more constructive transparency? So the media is certainly an unpopular institution, right? We're up there with used car salesmen and politicians, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the sort of, uh, anti-media stuff you see, you saw at the Donald Trump rallies where the sort of people were shaking their fists in the face of people who were just like operating television cameras it was disturbing, uh, to say the least. I, was, I never covered that, I don't cover politics, so I, I just was watching that like you were. Um, everything is, is, obviously we're living through an unusually polarized time. Uh, this, this is this culmination of forces that were set in motion 30 or 40 years ago to some extent. You know, it used to be that the political parties were very scrambled. You had liberals in the Republican Party in the North and you had conservatives in the Democratic Party in the South, a sort of hangover even from the Civil War when conservatives in the South were never gonna be Republicans because Lincoln was a Republican. And then after the Civil Rights Movement as a result of that, a great sorting began in which more and more now, and now you, the party's purified and drew apart because they had to win, people had to win primaries and were more concerned about that than general elections in Congress in particular. And you add to that sort of general sense where there's, there's no one you could look across the aisle on and say, I could work with you on this because it's team A and team B and it's very ideologically pure. You add to that the, uh, you know, the fracturing effect of the internet and the rise of, uh, you know, overtly partisan news sources and the sort of inability to distinguish in your Facebook feed between something that was written by someone who was genuinely trying to understand the truth and someone that was, maybe even if they let down and dropped the ball on some particular day, that kind of person who would run a correction as a result. And the sort of crazy stuff that's floating around there and looks like normal news. Um, and, and people were able to just sort of live in their own echo chamber where whatever team they're on is always the hero, and whichever team they're not on is always the villain. Uh, it's sort of, a, it's, it's ugly times, but on the other hand, it's also very robust times. I don't know if there's a solution other than you just keep doing the best you can, and if people uh, wanna hear what you have to say because they think it's of value to them, they'll read it, and they don't, they don't have to. It's not a satisfying answer, but I'm not sure there is one. Anyone else? I think we're running out of time. So listen, thank you all very much for coming out. Again, in particular, an honor to be here. Thank you.